Hello and welcome to the OM Genomics Show. I am Maria Adestad. I am trying a slightly different introduction uh, this time. Figured I would take a walk because it's nice outside. Today I wanted to share with you all how I organized my bioinformatics work. And this is not something I originally thought about making a video about, but I noticed that a few of my coworkers had noticed me using some of these systems and were like, oh, actually that's really useful. I'm going to start doing that too. And so I wanted to share it with you all. And these are especially things that I think I should have used earlier, especially as I was starting my PhD and doing research for the first time. So I've been doing bioinformatics now for about eight years uh, since I started my PhD. And I really wish I had done some of these things much earlier. Um, so hopefully this will be helpful to you. I'm going to share with you three different small systems that I've been employing that you can set up today that are not that hard to keep up with. Let's hop on the computer and get going. The first system I want to show you is something you can think of as a lab notebook. This is where I take extremely detailed notes on everything I'm doing, especially anything I'm running on the command line. So this is a bunch of text files in Markdown, and it's a Git repo. And so each file represents an experiment or stage of an investigation or something like that. And I make sure that anything I'm running on the command line is captured in one of these files with context on what it was for. I'll construct my commands in one of these files and then paste it into the command line, usually having this window open alongside the command line so I can copy back and forth. If I get errors on the command line, I then copy those into one of these files in the lab notebook right below the command that I ran. So I'm writing down my debugging journey, outcomes, and things to follow up on. It's crucial to have a historical log of what I was doing. This is extremely useful to me. So I name each file here, starting with the date, and then a few words about what I'm doing in there. The dates keep everything in timeline order. It quickly got confusing before I started adding the dates because I would do multiple rounds of similar analyses, and they would be in alphabetical order when you, like in this listing. So when you label them with the date in this kind of format with the year, then the month, then the day, then the alphabetical listing in your IDE is also the timeline order. So that's a really neat way to have it organized. The added titles after each date on the file helps me find relevant notes quickly, just at a glance. And that way I can use my previous work as a cheat sheet and easily reproduce my analyses later. Um, this is very useful because there are some things you don't do very often. And so being able to go back and look at exactly what you did, what worked, what didn't, and how you resolved any issues along the way can be extremely helpful to make sure that you're not repeating any of those problems again. You can back up the notes to GitHub, which is also great practice for using Git. Using Markdown is convenient because it's easily supported by your IDE and helps keep your notes readable with things like titles for your sections, bullet points, and above all, code snippets. So using Markdown is also good practice, and it makes it easy to copy pieces of your notes into all sorts of places, including documentation on GitHub, or even a Jekyll blog you can host on GitHub pages, as well as probably, you know, copy it into anywhere like Slack, where these back ticks also have meaning. So this was a great way to communicate code snippets with your team as well. Just having it stored already means that it's way easier for you to share it. So this keeps me nice and organized. This is a system that I've come up with after probably years of slightly under-documenting what I was doing. And I think if I had done this in my PhD, it would have been a little easier at the end of the project after uh, a few years, like three years of work, to scrape together the analyses that we had done along the way so we could share the scripts on GitHub and so on alongside the paper. So this makes it very easy for you to reproduce your analyses, not just for yourself, but also for your fellow scientists. And you can share tricks with other people very easily if you have your notes in this kind of format and just, you know, make sure to write everything down. 
So that's one major system that I use. So the second system I want to show you is this type of journal. Now this is just a sample so I can show you a little bit what the system looks like. Um, but I'll usually have one document like this per year or if it gets too long I'll cut it into two and it'll be like the first half of a year or so on. And I'll link back to the previous one and then forward to the next one when it uh, when the next one exists. So I use headers and I'll usually put a date just at the beginning of the week, but then I'll still have the days of the week for the rest. And you can see that this shows up on the sidebar. So what I do is I'll usually just like write down what happened, uh, what I was working on. And very importantly, I also keep lists at the bottom of things I want to do in the future. And I can also use this as a space to reflect or jot down some quick notes, like remember to make calendar event for that uh, team dinner. And so this way nothing slips through the cracks, right? I'm always in this document. I'm always writing down what I'm doing here. It, This is, you know, the first place I go every morning is in this document. I look at what I was doing yesterday, where did I leave off? And usually at the end of the day, I'm writing myself a couple of notes like, you know, next, do that other thing. Um, so I can use this way to just make sure that nothing slips through the cracks and I'm able to remember all the little things I want to do. And so this is the document that I basically live out of at work. Even when I work on a team that uses JIRA or something similar to that, like larger systems to track to-dos uh, that are more team-wide, I still like having a lightweight little list like this that's totally private to just myself and contains my personal priorities and things I personally want to remember. And because I can jot things down really quickly and not have to keep it presentable to anyone else, it's very important that this is private. Um, otherwise it completely stops working because it becomes something that you have to keep neat for other people, not just a way to organize what's in your own brain. And often this is the place that I will maybe start typing uh, a little bit more detail on a particular task and then decide, oh, I need to turn this into like a JIRA issue or whatever your equivalent is. But I often use this space as a place to take some quick meeting notes, um, sometimes just at the bottom, and then I'll like copy them, you know, up here and be like, oh, these are the notes, right? And so then I can just kind of put all the notes in here. And so this document is the central place that I always am working out of. And it's very lightweight. I like using Google Docs for this because it's instantly backed up. I use this on my phone all the time. Um, so because you can open Google Docs in an app on your phone, you can also put in um, things you want to remember there. And that way, you know, so if there's something that's bugging you in your free time, you want to pull out your work computer, you can write a quick note to yourself right into this document. And that way, you know that you're not going to forget to do that one thing that you just remembered. And then it gets out of your brain onto the document and you don't have to think about it anymore and you can truly unplug. So this is where I take quick notes to myself during a meeting. It's also where I reflect and brainstorm ideas for things I want to do next or think through various little issues. Uh, the fact that it's private means I can use this document for whatever is on my mind right now and I can always copy paste it out of a out of this document into somewhere more official if something graduates to the level of importance where I need to share it with other people. Now, if I have one of those meetings, like a team stand up or update meeting, where I'm supposed to update my coworkers or lab mates or whoever on what I was doing over a given time period, I can simply scroll up and say, okay, that was since last Wednesday until this Wednesday. And let me just, you know, look at what the items are and I can basically just copy the parts I want and put them in a little section down here. And then I copy that little section over into the document or the Slack or wherever we are doing team updates. So that way it's really quick for me to 
gather everything I had done in the last week without having to go to a bunch of different places looking for evidence of these things because they're already in here. I've added them as I went. This also helps if I need to compile a list of achievements for some kind of performance evaluation at work. You're never gonna forget some project you did. You just, you know, even if you're scrolling up half a year or a whole year to find out what you did, you can just scroll up, skim through, and look for all the things that are like your major project and you can write those down. And then the other thing I'll do is if there are small things along the way that are impressive or something like this one, then I'll usually write hashtag perf next to them. And that way I can go and search for hashtag perf across the document so I can gather like all the um, small evidences of achievements and so on. Um, which can be pretty helpful when you're compiling that sort of list at the end. You don't have to go and try to remember everything you did. And so yeah, that's basically the system. I think this really does help me stay organized and keep myself on track. So the third thing I want to show you is a much smaller system, but it is basically just the idea of actually capturing all the log outputs of all the bioinformatics tools that you run so that you can reconstruct later what happened. You can see the log messages as soon as they're coming out while also saving them so that you can look at them a year in the future when you wonder something about what happened. You can actually reconstruct it pretty easily. I use this especially when I'm using bioinformatics tools because they take a little longer to run often and they might have some warnings or errors or things like that that you probably want to be able to capture. Now if you just run something like this just on the command line by itself, the program will usually run and it'll work and you'll only see the end of the output of it. Uh, so if there are any logs coming out of it, they just spit it out on the command line, right? And if you've ever had trouble like reconstructing, oh, where's the beginning of this error? <laughs> because the error message is so long that you don't see the whole thing. Or you're using screen or tmux or one of those and it hides most of the output from you if you switch screens in between. And now you can't trace what was going on anymore. So it's very key to be able to write the output to a log file. Now, if you have done something like this in the past, that would write the output to a log file, which is fine but it only gets you part of the output, which is called standard out. So there's actually two streams of output coming from most programs, we'll use both. Um, you have standard out for just output, and you have standard error, which is where it'll usually put error messages and any warnings and things like that, and sometimes also some other information. Uh, but generally, when I want to see what logs are coming out of a program, I want to capture both. And so what this does is it takes standard error, which is number two, it's like stream number two, and it passes it into stream number one, which is standard out. Now you have standard out and standard error, and then you could just write that to a file. But I also piped T, which gets me the benefit of showing the output on the command line the way you would normally just see it flowing by, so you can see what's happening in real time. But it also writes the, that same standard out to this log file. So now where do you write the log file to? This is going to show up next to the output. So I gave it a path that's similar to where the outputs are going to get written to. Um, and I always give it a dot log suffix, which is just a neat way for me to see what are all my log files, because there are lots of files that come out with like dot txt or something. So I like to just call it dot log so it's easy to spot. And 
eventually I started adding a timestamp to this too. And so this timestamp helps because if I end up running the same command multiple times, and let's face it, we often end up discovering that we need to try something with a slightly different parameter or something, and I might even be running more than one instance of this at the same time. So the first one might not even have finished, and I'll be like, oh, I need to add this and this um, parameter to it as well. And I rerun it, or it was broken and through an error, and I want the next one to show up in a different place so I can still see the log message from the first run that had the error. And so this timestamp will preserve the logs of multiple runs. So this is really helpful for reconstructing what actually happened with your commands. Now that you have these logs, you can start grepping through them, searching for issues and so on, and you can use it to just make sure that your run actually worked as you thought it did. And that way your log messages are also handy if you need to ask the tool developer about something on GitHub issues, for instance. So it's really nice to have these logs available. And this also intersects nicely with the first system I showed, the lab notebook, because then I know where to go look for the logs. So I can answer questions like weeks or months or even a year from now. Back then, did it have that error that we're seeing now a year later? Has our program always produced this string of warnings? And did we just ignore it last time? So you can, you know, uh, reconstruct a lot of these things that can sometimes be pretty confusing uh, when you don't have the logs to look back on. So that's the third system. And I think that wraps it up for all the systems. So hopefully you found those tips useful and found something that you want to steal for yourself. Now, if you want to subscribe to the channel, you can do that here. And YouTube thinks you'll like this video. And I'm going to put a different video here that I think you'll like based on the content of this video. So um, yeah, thank you. See you all. Bye.